chat up online. Isn't it amazing you can go and, and rent one of these things and so much other dangerous stuff at the home center with like no training, yeah. uh, no explanation of how it works. I, I love this country. I really do. You yeah. can rent a bulldozer. I know. <laughs> yeah. I've done it. I have done this. Yeah. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Deputy Editor Matt Milham. What up? And our very special guest, former FHB Senior Editor and Carpenter and Man About Town, Andy Engel. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's good to have you, Andy. Yeah. Please email us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Wow, it's good to have you here. It's excellent to be here. It's been months since I've been in the building. <laughs> <laughs> we should tell folks, um, you worked at Taunton for many years on several occasions. I have, yeah. I've, I've... But most recently, you've gone back to working for I, a living. I now work for a living. I'm a lead carpenter <laughs> for a company called Hudson Valley Preservation. Uh, we do work on mostly old houses in the Hudson Valley and western Connecticut. And what are you working on right now? Uh, well, my most recent project was I finished up a uh, basement remodel in a, uh, it wasn't that old a house, it was 1947. Uh, I imagine some guy coming home from World War II and saying, We need I a want house. What? We need a house. We need a house, <laughs> and I want to build it out of stone. Uh -huh. And so it was actually a structural stone wall. Uh, Cool. And we had some leak issues, some moisture issues that we So addressed. just the basement or the whole house is st stacked masonry? The, it's a walkout basement, so it's sort of a, almost like a split level. Uh -huh. So uh, most of the basement is structural stone, and that's a, it's a walkout basement. So there used to be a kitchen down there. It's good living space. Cool. But over the years, it's suffered. Uh, and it was never thermally a very good performer because the R value of stone, stone is probably in the negative numbers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what did you guys do to fix that? Um, well, we did some drainage work, and then we, uh, we did a steel stud wall, uh, and we used uh, the paperless drywall, the yep. uh, GP uh, Dens Armor. Um, and then we did uh, spray foam insulation uh, on top of the stone. I think that's one of the applications where spray foam is really appropriate. Yeah, you guys, as a company, try not to use foam products, right? We try to avoid foam uh, just from a global warming perspective. Yep. Because most foams, if you look at the uh, the chemicals that go into them, the global warming potential outweighs the energy savings, the potential energy savings down the road. I don't know that that's true of every foam product, mm -hmm. but with the most common ones, it, it is. Uh, when we... For exterior insulation, for example, when we're using a rigid product, now we try to use Gutex, which is a wood fiber. It's a wood fiber insulation that's uh, made in Europe. It's a little bit hard to get. Four seven five building products. Uh, is and company. this is the product that you've been following, right? Yeah. Matt? Yep. I've been following one of you guys' projects. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. like two miles from my house. That's perfect. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of that stuff? I like it. Um, you know, it's a little heavier uh, to handle than foam, but it's that's not a big deal. It's got a, a great tongue and groove uh, assembly system. Um, it's got a lot of advantages. I'm my only hesitation is in they say you can use it for the WRB, um, and I because it's waxy. Because it's waxy. It's got paraffin. In mm -hmm. it. uh, it's like seven percent paraffin or some such thing. Um, I bet that burns good. I, yeah. I, I, I assume there's flame <laughs> retardants in it as well. But if you start looking at flame retardants, you've got some chemical issues with them too. So does this product, which comes from Europe, right? Yeah. Is it normal sizes or is it sized it's a European metric size. style? It's a metric size. How do you make that work? Oh, we can handle it. It's it, it gets attached to the sheathing, so you're not worrying about. Um, having to hit studs when you're uh -huh. attaching it. And you just use long screws and washers. It's like putting up foam insulation, and then you put uh, um, a rain screen over it. So you're putting some one by on top of that or some two by on top of that. Hmm. What do you think about working as a carpenter again? I love it. Um, you know, I had been out of the field for 22 years, and I just was jonesing to go back to it. And the company I work for is a company I've known for a few years. I actually tried to get an article out of them, and it never quite gelled. Mm -hmm. And uh, they happened to be looking for a lead carpenter, and I happened to be looking for a way back into the field, and it all worked out. 
So, have you had to work in the dead of winter yet? I've had to work in it. I started in January. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it was a pretty warm January until a week after I started. <laughs> and then we're a couple of mornings we were out there uh, framing a, a screen porch edition. Uh, and it was in the single digits. But this is why we have Carhartt overalls. Uh, I've heard it said that Siberians have a saying, there's no bad weather, only bad clothing. I think that's absolutely <laughs> yeah. true. But they live in Siberia, though. Yeah. So. <laughs> What about you? What have you been doing? All kinds of stuff. But uh, anything fun? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I rented an auger, a tow-behind auger, and there was actually... I, that what, wasn't what, the what, one. What, what, what's this for? This is to drill, uh, basically, for footings and posts for my gazebo. Okay. Yeah. So these are the concrete footings that are going to hold this thing up. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you decided to rent this machine to make it easy. Yeah, I had originally reserved a smaller machine and uh, went to go pick that up. And as I got there, the girl was like, uh, I just gave that to somebody else. He said he was someone. used. I was like, what? <laughs> so, so you had someone impersonating you? Uh, apparently there was somebody impersonating me. That's I don't terrible. know what kind of a sick person <laughs> would do that. <laughs> That's a low life. Yeah. So you reserved this machine, and, that, and this woman says, are you the one who just reserved this machine? And he said, yes. And he said, yep. And he lied. And he lied. That's so and wrong. And he took my auger. I hope he's listening, <laughs> and yep. I hope he hurt his foot. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, then I had to run to uh, a box store and rent one, and uh, they had a bigger one. And I had kind of wanted to get this one anyway, but didn't really want to deal with the hassle of towing something, um, but it was fine. So you you went to the home center. You got this thing. It's yeah. got a, a gas engine and a hydraulic uh, power head, right? That exactly. spins the auger. Yeah, and it's probably more powerful than the one I was going to get, which seemed like it was going to be great, except that there's so many rocks and roots where I was trying to drill these holes. That you live, it, like, in the epicenter of rocks and roots, I'm yeah, sure. I think this whole region is just rocks and roots. There's really nothing underground. There's no, there's no soil. You got to truck that all in. Yeah. That's you ever use one of these rigs? I didn't, but you know, my, my son, I've had him dig a few holes for me. Yeah. And he said, Dad, why do we live in a quarry? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we know everybody smart moved out west. All the smart <laughs> right, farmers. Right. Nobody, no smart well, farmers the Midwest, stayed here. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I finally got the holes in, did a little sawzalling and all that, so... I think we fun. have some video of you running this rig, right? Yeah. And uh, we'll put that on the podcast page. Um, yeah, if anybody wants to see. <laughs> the thing starts real great. It's not have you meant seen to this, work on one hills. of these, Andy? What's up? Have you ever seen one of these? I, I've seen one yeah. of those, but I've never worked anywhere where they were useful. It looks <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you uh, listening to the motor, mm -hmm. it's on the far end of the mm -hmm. power head, and it's meant to counterbalance the weight of the, the yeah. drilling part. And it does a great job of yeah. that, but mm -hmm. it's not really meant to work on hills because it has wheels. As far as I know, it doesn't have brakes. Maybe they, it did, and I didn't get to that part of the instructor manual that was not included. <laughs> I had to look that up online. Isn't it amazing you can go and, and rent one of these things and so much other dangerous stuff at the home center with like no training, yep. uh, no explanation of how it works. I, I love this country. I really do. You yeah. can rent a bulldozer. I know. Yeah. I've done it. I have done this. Yeah. Oh, God, is that a fun thing to drive? Oh, too? Yeah. yeah. Nothing's better than heavy equipment. It's, yeah. And that is especially nice, nice, smooth ride. Mm -hmm. I don't, like, as, like driving a backhoe or a wheel load or whatever, that's, that'll like destroy your kidneys. Mm -hmm. But boy, a dozer, mm -hmm. it's like driving a limousine. Yeah. And then I fixed my rain barrel. Right, because you had um, low flow. Yeah, I had low flow. It was like, it was like a 60, 70-year-old man hanging out in a urinal. It was pretty much the amount of flow that I was getting That's out That's hitting a thing. little close to home, I've got to say. We're all on our way there. Moving on, moving on. <laughs> so how did you fix your uh, problem there? Uh, I used a bulkhead fitting, and I put a uh, what basically a boiler drain valve in there. And even though the valve it replaced was also the three-quarter inch, this thing has, has a, much, a much bigger hole. In much it. bigger aperture inside yeah. and a lot more flow. And I'm actually able to run a tiny little sprinkler. We have Whoa. video Barely. of that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's adorable. Yeah. <laughs> and spraying probably about three feet to either side. <laughs> but that's hugely helpful, right? If you're yep. trying to water your grass. Yeah. Yeah. And then your, your kitty hates the video <laughs> camera, apparently. No, she loves cameras. I cannot take out my phone without her trying to jump in front of it. So... Uh, it sounds like kids today. Yeah. That's awesome. So you all should check that out on the podcast page. That's uh, worth the price of admission, I got to say. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk about it too much, but I've been continuing to work on the bedroom. Uh, last installment, we talked about the difficulty in picking uh, wall colors, which uh, we've done. And uh, I think we're both very happy with what the color is. It looks like uh, more gray than it in this photograph than it does in real life. It's kind of a blue gray, and it's, I think it's real handsome. Yeah. So the next step is to reinstall the base trim, uh, caulk that to the wall, uh, and then put a second coat of wall color on and paint the rest of the trim and hopefully move back in, which would be sweet. So where are you sleeping in the meantime? So we have a bedroom set up in the upstairs of the barn, cool. which is fine. It's nice and quiet. Um, it's fine. Got no complaints. In fact, it's more comfortable than the house because there's no south-facing windows, mm. so it doesn't get the solar gain that the house gets. So it's you pretty got nice out there. Up there. Nope. That's the single downside. <laughs> and it is a downside, I got to yeah. say. I had a loft bedroom that I slept in for about, I don't know, a week before I was like, nope. This is <laughs> kind of, it, it, it wakes you up. It had a ladder yeah. down to the first floor. Mm -hmm. And trying to navigate a ladder through like a hatch when you're tired is no. It's a hazard. <laughs> don't do it. Yeah. So you have... You have to either, yeah, you have to go in the house, which it, it ends up waking me up because it's like walking yeah. too far. It's, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're anxious to get back in. We've had some uh, listener feedback uh, from, uh, this was from Paul, who you may recall uh, was buying a house with the uh, furnace in the attic. And this is the same guy who had the 15-point plan on how to improve the efficiency of his HVAC system. This is a very typical listener, Andy. Mm -hmm. um, Part of his plan was to clear the blown-in insulation from the soffit vents with a leaf blower. Mm -hmm. And you and I both thought... Bananas. That <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> we thought that he meant from the inside right. he was going to go mm -hmm. over. And, and, but he actually meant he was going to do it from the outside. Right, so which, he wanted to... Yeah. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. yeah. That may be genius. If it works, yeah. it's genius. If it doesn't, then, you know, it's bananas. He wanted, us to, <laughs> he wanted us to know that he was not bananas and mm -hmm. that he was going to do this from the outside. Yeah. And cantankerous Dave who also pointed this out on YouTube, uh, that was his assessment too. So Yeah, we're Thank just dumb. We're, we're slow. just dumb. Dave Smart. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Cantankerous Dave. He's also a typical listener. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah, I'm familiar with social media. So. <laughs> <laughs> we also heard from someone describing themselves as, name withheld since my advisory role is a political appointment by the local county government. It's so I, I was immediately intrigued when I saw this. I'm like, okay. So... Uh, he or she writes, a uh, longtime listener and magazine subscriber. I'm a retired engineer and consultant with my hobby of house hacking, flipping, restoration, spec homes, smart home, efficiency mods, etc. that I turned into a solopreneur role. Have you guys have hold, heard of a solopreneur? No. no. I hadn't either. Is that actually a word? Or I is don't that... know. I, I, I trust him. He works for the government. Come oh, on. okay. It's <laughs> fine. Man. We're good. <laughs> During a recent build, I was frustrated by the local water district's requirement that all new sewer taps must be conducted by a certified tapper. I dug deeper and found it was just a simple test, a fee, and a performance bond, so I enlisted. <clears throat> it's a long story, but I now have a senior advisory role with the water district, and I have uncovered a topic that, surprisingly, your show or magazine has not discussed. In a nutshell, your sewer bill is or soon will be the fastest growing expense in your house with no way to stop it. Here's why. Revenue is declining for most water districts. Efficient water usage is now common, and most homeowners update their appliances when they, when they leak or break. These new appliances are low flow. The trend will continue for years. New turn-ons can't keep pace with the reduction in water use. B, 96% of the cost of running a treatment plant and pipe maintenance, et cetera, are fixed costs. Most utility bills are based on consumption, the cubic feet of water used. That's changing, and most municipalities will go to a base rate. FYI, it's a rate increase for low- to mid-use households since the high water users under the variable model were, were subsidizing the lower water users. Surprisingly, our research shows that low-income residents will get the price reduction. Why? They rarely purchase new efficient appliances and tend to live with leaks, etc. For in Short terms, they're high water users. Most pre-1960 infrastructure is a combined storm and sanitary system. Given climate change and the intense rainfall, most systems overflow and contaminate water fills and basements and streets. Uh, the Clean Water Act of 1978 requires water districts to fix this, and it's not cheap to upsize pipes or add catch slash retention basins in existing metro areas. Backflow valves help the homeowner, but that just results in more overland flooding. 
Wow. So Ooh. you have some experience with this. Uh, I do. <laughs> and, and you were also a government representative. Well, I, I am. That is true. And it sounds to me like, you know, the cost of the sewer district hasn't changed. Right. And you've still got the same number of users. They just have to change their billing model. And they have to have the same pipes, the same pumps, the same tanks, yeah, that, no matter how much pe water people are using. That all makes sense. Yeah. So the, your rate might be going up, but if your usage is going down, is your net cost going up? According to, and there's a magazine for everything. Of course right? there is. <laughs> uh, Municipal Water and Sewer Magazine mm -hmm. of May 14th, 2019, it is in fact true that between 2016 and 2018, charges increased 7.2% for water and 7.5% for wastewater. During the same span, the consumer price index increased 4.6%. So it's going up. Well, I'm still not sure what charges mean. Does, yeah, does that know. mean rate or does that mean the bottom line on your bill that you have to write a check for? Right. I, my guess is that it's going to be at least as much as it used to be or mm. more because Never. the the money always goes up. <laughs> and his uh, our letter writer's point is that um, these are fixed costs, yeah. right? You can't, you, you can't you can't they can't lower them. No. So you. You're, it doesn't seem like it's going to go down. No, but how significant is that? I, I really don't know. I, I can I've tell never... you it's cheaper than drilling a well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. which is yeah. what I come back to. But, I mean, even according to this thing, if you get to the end of it, I mean, a lot of these costs are coming from having to make infrastructure improvements that have been kind of kicked down the road for decades, decades right. not generations. Decades. Right. And so all this is sort of coming to a head now because everything is breaking and, you know, I mean, you've got, like, the Flint water crisis right. that kind of, like, shines a spotlight on and, and that's sort of a, the bigger issue. Every older city has these same problems. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I have a buddy who was a paid firefighter in Danbury. And uh, when he was promoted to captain and got to run his first fire, he said, I burned it to the ground because it was an older section of town. And it had a four-inch cast iron water main that it was from the 1890s. And he <laughs> said it was so corroded that he'd have been lucky to you know, get, any, a, get any water. Get any water out of it. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what the solution is, but I mean, you got to have water, you mm -hmm. got to have sewers, mm -hmm. and someone's got to pay for it. Yeah, exactly. I guess it's us. Yeah. Well, not me, because I have a well and septic. Me too. <laughs> Do you have city water? No, well and septic, but I grew up um, basically on the New York City water supply, even though I grew up uh, sort of like on the edge of the Catskills. Sure. Uh, we were uh, next to the Catskill Aqueduct, I think it's called. And uh, yeah, our water was out of that. But the, right now there's a, a huge um, repair operation going on. They're basically building like a big diversion tunnel for the Delaware Aqueduct because that one's losing something like 18 million gallons a day. And uh, so in order to make repairs in that, they're building a, a separate tunnel to carry the water. They'll divert it. Yeah. Well, yeah, so they can actually fix the tunnel, fix the Can you leaks. imagine what all that costs? I mean, yeah. like municipal yeah. projects are crazy expensive. But think about that one. I mean, how old is that that tunnel, that original tunnel? It's probably 100 pushing years. 100 years old. Yeah. yeah That's it pretty be, amazing. I'm trying to remember when they built that one. It may have been even in the 50s, but I mean. Mm -hmm. Even you're talking, so, yeah. you're talking 60, 70 years old. Yeah, yeah. If you guys want an indication of um, how much is this going to cost, the American Water Works Association, I think is what it was. Forgive me for that. Yeah, the American Water Works Association has a 2012 report that expects that uh, expanding U.S. drinking water infrastructure will top $1 trillion over 25 years. Wow. Yeah, and that's not even the wastewater portion. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I think there's going to be job security for those folks who are in the uh, infrastructure business. We also heard from uh, Trogdor in response to our discussion of bug repellent in episode 186. And you, you seem to indicate you're sick of talking about this. Well, I think this is the, at least the third time it's come up. <laughs> well, I'll keep it brief. But I liked Trogdor's uh, succinct uh, description of per permethrin versus DEET. And you mm. also have experience with this. Oh, yeah. I've, I've had three deer ticks on me this year already. You know, and same. you've had Lyme more than once, I've right? I've had Lyme twice, yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, Trogdor says permethrin is an insecticide, which is skin safe once dried. DEET is a repellent, which is skin safe, wet or dry, but which rapidly dissipates. Studies show that DEET alone is a lot more effective at preventing bites than permethrin alone, but a combination couldn't hurt. Permethrin, pyrethrin, delta methrin, zeta cypermethrin. How am I doing here? Will there be a test? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and their patented cousins, 
pyrethroids are based on uh, natural insecticides found in lemongrass, geranium, citronella, and chrysanthemum oil and have been used for thousands of years. When you have a mosquito repellent candor torch, you're evaporating pyrethroids into the air. So Great. I bet you were wondering about that. I was so curious. <laughs> <laughs> we also asked listeners for help with building watertight rooftop decks in episode 187. Good subject, right? That's a, yeah, that's a good subject. Um, hard to do. It is hard to do. You have to always be thinking about repairability. Yeah. You know, cause, I always think about uh, ice. Yeah. Right? Because mm. if you build a flat deck that holds water and it has to hold water, right. it's going to freeze. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, ben Bogey, who's a lead carpenter for Colbert Building in Portland, Maine, uh, answered our call uh, to contractors on their methods. Uh, he says, regarding rooftop decks, I've dealt with this a few times, and here's my standard operating procedure. If it's going over a level surface, you need to create pitch. On a wood frame, I use pre-pitched polyiso roof insulation, which slopes one quarter inch per foot. I think that's what we said also, mm -hmm. right? If we're going over a concrete slab system, we apply a bond coat and create a pitched, dry-packed mortar bed like an old-school shower pan, and then an EDPM or EPDM or TPO glue-down membrane tied into the wall, WRB, and terminated at the edge with a sheet metal drip edge. On top of the membrane, I use bison or MRP deck pedestals. Do you want to tell us what those are, Andy? You're familiar with these, right? Sure. They're, they're a plastic uh, uh, screw jack almost, a low-profile uh, thing. You've got a base and a top that screws into the base. And it's adjustable. And it's can, adjustable, yes. So you can compensate for the pitch underneath, right? Exactly. And especially if you're working on a concrete deck, they're never exactly flat. flat. Yeah. So, yeah. They, they, it's a nice product. It's not an expensive. I'm no, sure, it's but it's not. Um, and you need, a, you need a bunch of them mm -hmm. because you're talking usually about a pretty low profile deck. So you're not typically putting down two by 10 joists. Right. You know, you might be putting down two by four sleepers or something like that. That's his method. He said he's put, he puts these on a 16 or 24 inch grid with two by sleepers on the flat on top of the pedestals. Right. Uh, the pedestals are screw adjustable for level. And once everything is tuned, the pedestals are glued with a high quality compatible exterior adhesive like OSI Quad Max or similar. If there's a concern of wind uplift, I install a 4 by guard post before starting any of this tied into the structural framing, flashed and counterflashed at membrane install, and then the outer courses of sleepers are tied to those guardrail posts. It's not the lowest cost method, but it works and is pretty simple for the average carpenter to pull off correctly. I think that's good advice. And it's got the advantage of not having any roof penetrations. Yes, you know, and as, as your point was, you could pull these, uh, this wood framing off, the pieces are going to be pretty small, and mm. then you could repair the roof membrane, yeah. and, which you're going to have to inevitably. Um, on the subject, we also heard from our friend Bob of Homer Modeling Pros in Annapolis, Maryland. He says to check out Duradec or DecTech. And it, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Andy, uh, Duradec and DecTech are thick vinyl membranes, like you'd have thick vinyl flooring that's waterproof, right? Uh, I'm not familiar with those two. Uh, I believe uh, that's the, I know that's the case with Duradec, but I'm not sure about deck tech, but it's just think of thick, heavy duty sheet flooring, mm -hmm. and that's your waterproof layer that's also your uh, walking surface. Hmm. Okay. So it's got a kind of texture on it. You can mm -hmm. have it look like weathered wood or stone or what have you. It seems like a good solution, and I'm betting it's going to be much less expensive than Ben's method, but it's probably uh, not as durable. Vinyl flooring for your deck. Great, right? <laughs> All right, should we take some questions? Yes. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, podcast hosts, whoever it may be today. My name is Sean, and I reside in Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. Here's my situation. I began my carpenter career at the age of 22, uh, six years ago at an ICF company. The work was about 75% ICF installation and the remaining 25% was framing. I was put through trade school while working there but began my fourth slash final year feeling a real lack of diversity in my skill set and experience. During that fourth year of school, I ran an old friend who was running a remodeling company and I signed up. It was during this time that I really grew to love carpentry and was introduced to the podcast. Long story short, I didn't work out at my end because of money, so I went back to the ICF company in December. And it used to be a stable job, but with recent house purchase and a second child being born and my wife at home with the kids, our expenses have increased. A combination of a sketchy economy and poor business practices has now led to some recent pay cut, which have become too much for me to endure. Here's the current situation of my question. I quit that job last week out of necessity. I've turned my work on the side 
my side work into full-time carpentry business. My goal is to be a one-stop shop for kitchen and bath renovations. I like the indoor work with our brutal winter and the fact that the weather can't interfere with the consistency of my job site not to mention the variety of design and skills involved. The thing that gives me pause is this. There are many skills which I have not yet to acquire for doing that kind of work, such as drywalling. I've done very little. Tiling, none. Flooring, again, done very little. And some other odds and ends. I really think that a good sense of carpentry has given me the ability to learn these things quickly, and I truly desire to give a client a great finished product. What are your thoughts on how to go about learning skills while working on other people's homes? I never intend to leave people with a crummy product, but where is that fine line between doing, being naive and foolish, not ill-intentioned, and realizing that you will often be, do, not, you'll be often doing something for the first time on a large number of jobs? Thank you for all you do. Fine home building has been encouraging, inspiring, and instructional to my career. Okay, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> That's one I can speak to Let's go. from yeah. direct experience. And You've one, done this. I've done this. When I started out as a carpenter in 1986, um, I had previously worked in a mill workshop, so I knew how to hang doors, but that was most of what I knew. But I've been reading Fine Home Building. This is a shameless plug for the magazine. I've been reading Fine Home Building since its inception. And I continued to read that through the years. That was a great resource, and it's even better today because so much of the content is available easily online. Yep. Um, so if you've got the right attitude and a knowledge of what you don't know and what you need to learn and the talent for it, I think this gentleman's going to be just fine. What is going to happen to him is that he is going to underprice some jobs, <laughs> and he's going to Tell work. us about that, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and he's going to end up working a lot of hours um, because he's an ethical guy who doesn't want to leave his customers In hanging. the lurch, yeah. yeah. So um, that's the price he's going to pay because he doesn't want to make his customers pay the price of his education. Uh, and it's hard. I used to work 80 hours a week at times, and... There you go. I, uh, I, I, th I would, add, I think that's great input. I would add too. Uh, rely on good subcontractors, and I don't know how you find those people, but it's, there are certain things you probably should not experiment with, and among them are tile showers. Mm -hmm, right. Um, well, then, then there you can go get educated, right? And there, Schluter's got classes. Yeah, and everybody's they're free. got classes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's in a uh, a rural place, so mm -hmm. th that's more difficult that to is. learn stuff, yeah. right? Um, Practice on your own house. Practice yeah, I would, on your that's own another house. good yeah. suggestion. As much as possible. I mean, you can pick up like relatively cheap materials at a place like you know the Habitat for Humanity Restore. I don't know if he has anything like that, but salvage yard sales. I mean, he's going to have access to used stuff too. Like yeah. that's one of the yeah. things when you're a contractor is like you have access to all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah, you get a real good redneck pile <laughs> in the backyard yeah. waiting for projects to start up. But I do like how he says he's going to turn his side work into his full-time job, but he's never done most of these jobs in his I, side work. So. I, I, yeah. I, I think it's a... I admire his bravery. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, you can do it. If you've got mm -hmm. the, the aptitude, you can learn this stuff. Another uh, source for information I would really recommend is their suppliers. If you work with a good supply house, good tile supply house, good masonry supply house, good lumber yards, a lot of times they have some expertise in-house that can help you. Totally. Yeah. And they can also put you uh, potentially in touch with good subcontractors to do the stuff that you probably shouldn't touch. Absolutely. But even if you're doing this stuff in your own house, track how much time it's taking you to do those things, the every cost job of all you the do. materials. Yeah every, yeah, every job, but definitely even when you're practicing, like you know, log all of that. Make sure that you are like getting good data before you start to try to bid jobs. Bid jobs. Yeah. yeah. And when you do bid a job, estimate how much time it's going to take and then double it. Mm -hmm. And you probably still won't have enough hours built into it. Yeah. I was going to say focus on your business education too, because the people I know who are successful contractors know how to run a business, maybe more than they even know how to build. Uh, it's you're you're having to learn two important things at the same time, right. and you you have to learn both of them, or you're going to be bankrupt. Well, I think you need to decide which you want to be too. There are two different kinds of contractors. You've got the uh, I call them artisanal contractors. They're the people who hands on, hands on. They want to do the work, and that's fine. And their income is going to be limited by the amount of hours that they can put into it. Um, and then you've got an entrepreneurial contractor who ends up working through subcontractors, so on and so forth, and there's a lot of leverage there so he can make more money, but you can't be both. You, there aren't enough hours in the day to be both, and that was a mistake that I tried, that I made. 
that you wanted to run the business and be hands on with everything. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's yeah. hard to, to do. You yeah. just, you don't have a family life at the end of it. Um, that, or you have to take on really small projects, I would say, and, char and you have to charge enough and yeah. it's really hard to charge enough. I, you know, the e myth contractor is a really, is a pretty good book that, uh, explores that relationship between the two ways of approaching business. I, there are other uh, textbooks we've talked about and, and past podcasts too, and the elements of building uh, Kershaw, is that that guy's I name? I think so, and David Gerstel too. Uh, these are things you need to get intimately familiar with. Yeah. It's, it's easy to go broke uh, being a contractor. Yeah. And not see your family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, hello writes Brad. Are you aware of any information on the contribution of spray foam to the strength of the physical structure? If so, where can I find this information? I poked a bit around on GBA, and there's a lot on spray foam, but it's hard to f not get lost in the weeds looking for this information. I had a local spray foam contractor say to me that one inch of, I'm assuming closed cell foam, was the strength equivalent of half inch sheathing. He was going to forward the info for my review. I gave up the prodding after several weeks of weekly re-requests re for the info. <laughs> he also never showed up to give me my building a look for bids. Answer was, always call back next week. Um, I have an old warehouse with a questionable skin. I'm thinking about insulating with spray foam with the idea that it will strengthen the structure in addition to the higher R value. The building is in Salt Lake City, Utah, so it's a dry climate with hot summers and somewhat cold winters, only an occasional spell of single-digit temperatures, and it's rarely below zero. The building skin is three inches thick corrugated aluminum panels, which are recycled jet engine shipping crate. <laughs> right. <laughs> I thought the building looked pretty normal given its yeah. odd uh, construction. Uh, the corrugated middle is cardboard-like with some type of resin on it. It sucks all the heat out in the winter and think a uh, frying pan in the summer. The framing is four by six is about four foot on center with two by X bracing in each bay. The panels are working loose. Well, go figure. They're not nailed anywhere, mm -hmm. right? They're yeah. like, <laughs> the panels are working loose. I think a big expansion and contraction issues with the aluminum panels. Uh, I'm refastening as I do exterior repair and paint with long timber lock screws and washers. This portion of the building was built in the early 70s. Do you think the spray foam would help hold it together long term? Uh, the spray foam option is expensive, and I'm trying to figure out if it's worth saving and scrimping for in this case. Well, I decided to dig into this a little bit because I, I decided it was interesting enough to yeah. <laughs> answer myself. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is from the Spray Polyurethane Foam Alliance. So some of you are going to say that I shouldn't be citing them as a source because they have a vested interest in promoting their product. But um, there's been some research done. Uh, a study conducted at the University of Florida in 2007 found that uh, applying closed cell SPF under a roof deck provides up to three times the resistance to wind uplift for wood roof sheathing panels compared to a conventionally fastened roof. So the short answer is if you have a roof, yeah, it does help. Uh, building studies conducted in 92, 96, and 2007 have also shown that applying closed cell SPF to wall cavities can increase its racking strength i.e. the resistance to horizontal forces like high winds versus those without SPF. Uh, so, yeah. yes, it's yeah. going to help. Could you do something else that might help more? Quite possibly. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, a site-applied product like that is it's really hard to measure what you're getting, too. Right. Because no, and you'd have to test this building given its odd construction. Yeah. Is is it going to perform the same as something more conventionally framed? But if he's going to insulate anyway... And it seems like a good solution given the gaps and stuff uh, between the panels seems, right? Yeah, and it might help hold these panels in place. I think it probably will. Um, as far as, like, giving a definitive answer, man, I don't think we can because yeah. this is an oddball structure. <laughs> NAHB supposedly did some research on this in, like, the early 90s, and I wasn't able to find the actual report. I just see references to it in a bunch of other places. And they did find that it added some strength to the wall, but these walls, as far as I understood, all had exterior sheathing and drywall inside. So, <laughs> you know, it's hard to say like, yeah. if it's going to yeah. work on its own. Yeah. But uh, BASF has been working on, like, I think they call it the HP Plus wall system. This is something that I came across a few years ago when I was in school. Um, and that I think they just have exterior rigid foam. There's, like, metal cross strapping into the framing and they're, they're building these, I think 24 inches on center. So they're, you know, basically advanced framing. 
and then uh, just filling in behind that spray foam or behind the rigid foam with spray foam. And they say they're getting a wall that's at least as strong, if not stronger, than a conventionally framed house. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> I well, can't evaluate their claims independently. Yeah. But. What do you think about a SIP panel, structural insulated mm -hmm. panel? I mean, that's those are pretty rigid. I've seen them used for floors spanning 16 feet, and they're. I can tell you, you anecdotally, know. like when so we used to rehab houses, uh, old houses in Pittsburgh for Habitat for Humanity, and inevitably these places had a walkout basement and an odd sized basement door, and we had to put box on the opening mm -hmm. to put this door in, right? And when you would put uh, spray foam to glue these w uh, new bucks in place. There was nothing you could do to remove them. Yeah. They were stuck. The stuff's tenacious. It mm -hmm. is. Yeah. So I, I can't help but think it's going to help. Yeah. yeah. If you can swing the cost, there are probably, like I said, cheaper ways to do it. But had you heard that jet engines come in these? Oh, yeah. It's common knowledge. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're not going to put it in a wood box. <laughs> right? Because it costs like a gazillion dollars, right? All right. So uh, here we go. Hey, guys. I wanted to run a question by you about our back deck. I recently extended our deck all the way across the back of our house to add on to the existing. This brought the new deck across the slope backyard to the level area behind the garage. Now we only have four steps down to grade, which is nice. So apparently as a sloping lot, he's got... Uh, a deck that goes a full width of the back of his house and one uh, end is like four steps above grade and the other is 12 feet, it looks like. And uh, he says, the one negative I hate about the deck is that it's only 10 and a half feet from the wall to the railing. It gets a little tight out there with furniture. It's uh, 16 inches wide, but the depth, which is 10 and a half feet, isn't ideal. I'm trying to figure out a creative way that we could extend the deck's depth without tearing the whole thing down and starting over. Um, the deck, the part, the new part of the deck can remain ten and a half feet, but we we would prefer to add some depth to the screen porch area that we have planned. And he sent us a link to a YouTube video that we'll put up on the podcast. And you had, you guys had a chance to look at this. I yeah. did. We yeah. we don't have time to watch the whole thing here, but what do you think, guys? Well, I, the way he's got it built is he's got a flush girder on the outside of that deck. So his his ledger board, his outer uh, ledger board, call it, uh, is the beam. Is, is, is the beam, and uh, that is a problem uh, in terms of extending beyond that. But what I would suggest that he do is put a, a drop girder underneath that. You know, use the existing post that he's got. Uh, replace that flush girder with a, a, a drop girder that sits underneath the existing floor joists. And then he could sister back uh, with new floor joists uh, right next to the ones that already exist. He could take them back, take the old joist hangers off, replace them with double hangers. And Bob's your uncle. <laughs> hmm. Did you get all that? Yeah. So he's going to uh, put the redundant beam in there. Yeah. He's going to put an undergirder and the existing. Right. And he's going to get rid once that new beam is in, he's going to get rid of the existing beam. And that's going to allow him to uh, extend his deck by bearing on that beam. And is that he putting additional posts outside? No, the... he shouldn't. He'll just cantilever two feet past it. He only wanted to gain two feet, so a two-foot cantilever on a deck. But he's going to have a... A screen porch, which is going to have roof load and stuff. Right. Well, sure, it's got roof load, um, and you can calculate that. He's and, going to have to. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's a fair point. Uh, he may need a third uh, post underneath there, or he may be able to use the existing posts. The posts themselves aren't necessarily the problem. Is what are the footings? Can the footings handle right. the additional load? So, so that's th another question. We should we should identify all the questions here. If you want to do mm -hmm. Andy's method, which is to put the undergirder, right? You're mm -hmm. going to have to figure out the size of the footings, which means you're going to have to dig out and figure out how big they are, mm -hmm. and then figure out what kind of soiling, soil bearing capacity you have to mm -hmm. see if it's up to the job. Right, or you could just use the IRC right. default. So you need to have some familiarity with soils to know what mm -hmm. you have using those yeah. uh, categories that they have in the code. And Mike Gurton did a fantastic article on this a few years ago in Fine Home Building. How to tell your soil? Well, how to design deck footings. Okay, so we'll put that up on the podcast page. Yeah. Um, can you remember that? I will remember that. You're the best. <laughs> uh, and then we need to uh, determine that he might have to add a post or a footing. He or might. You're going to have to add both. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then you're going to be able to uh, sister Joyce to the existing ones and get your two feet potentially. Right. Okay. The other thing I thought about was, and agreed, if he's only going two feet, it makes less sense, but is to use 
the existing uh, flush beam, mm-hmm. put joist hangers on the yep. other side of it, extend it two feet, and have new posts with a girder, mm-hmm. yeah. and, and you essentially are building what amounts to a two-foot deck. You could do that, too, <laughs> yeah. sure. Um, and or you could tear this all down and start over. Yeah. And the trouble, one problem with doing like a two foot deck like that is you're always, no matter how careful you are, you're always going to end up with a little bump there. They're, pl- they're not going to plane out. They're not going to plane out. Um, and that may not matter. You know, it's, I would notice it, but given what he's trying to do, it may be absolutely fine. I think there's going to be some uh, budget considerations too, because I would be very tempted to leave the uh, posts, tear off the deck, and build it the right way. Hmm. Uh, I think it might be easier. Yeah. It, may not, taking a deck out is easy. He, he <laughs> may not actually have to dig down to find out the size of his footings. That may be on record at his at town, town hall. At the town office. Yeah. If there was a permit pulled and someone inspected it, yeah. that information would likely be there. Yeah. Anytime I've had footing decks inspected, the uh, inspector has always noted the, the size of them. Because it's hard to find a lot later, <laughs> as yeah. you point out. Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, boy, and this is from Cooper in southeast Wisconsin. Hello, I've been listening to your podcast for quite some time now, and I'm an avid DIYer and been working on my home on and off for the last two years. I want to thank you guys for all the good knowledge that you've made so easily accessible. Now off to the issue at hand. My 1905 Craftsman-style house has a north-facing deck. The way the deck and railings were constructed have caused the composite deck to bow in the middle and the railings to rot enough that you can push your thumb through it. Another part of the house is under construction for a new room for my second daughter, and I had extra room in the dumpster, so naturally, before finishing the new bedroom, I ripped into the railings on the deck and created another problem for myself. This guy sounds just like me. I'll save some money right, (laughs) by tearing my house apart. (laughs) The railings were integrated into the siding of the house right at the corner for whatever reason. Whenever the builder of this railing decided to construct the railing, he or she opted to destroy the two sets of aluminum siding, insulation, clapboards, and tar paper on the outside of the house as well. I have spent the last four years and thousands of dollars gutting, insulating, and air sealing this house. What is the right way to close up the hole? Keep in mind, I've become an FHB air sealing fanatic. We should, like, print T-shirts that say that. (laughs) I'm pretty sure. Uh, My plan is to to do a more modern, open aluminum railing. I think I got a pretty good solution for this. All right, let's hear it. I think a pie laster. That's exactly where I was going. So those of you who are unfamiliar with, uh, was it Greek? Uh, yes. <laughs> it's like half a column put against the wall mm-hmm. to make it match real columns, right? Mm-hmm. It's yeah. And you have some inspiration because you have these tapered columns holding up the porch roof. Right. Mm-hmm. I go there, yeah. right? And put that over the hole. Yeah. I mean, you, you'll need to flash to the side of that, get some uh, metal flashing, probably be the easiest the way to do too, it. And right? the top, too, right? Because the top is going to stop where the top of the railing is, I presume, or shortly beyond it. Yeah. Yeah. As far as I could tell, that's what was there, and that's what he ripped out. I think Essentially so. Essentially, it was a pilaster. So, yeah. yeah. Did I, am I saying that wrong? I don't know. I'm I've probably heard, saying it wrong. <laughs> I've heard it called pilasters. I don't know. Yeah. yeah I, I learned these terms on the job site, so that doesn't necessarily mean There's no. <laughs> <laughs> There's no grammar police on yeah. it. <laughs> What do you do behind it, though? Are you going to put anything back there? I'm going to put some um, Pro Trim uh, vinyl coil stock. Yeah. Because you're going to be able to slip that behind the existing WRB on the sides yeah. and the top. Yeah. And that's a tip I learned from uh, Bill Robinson mm-hmm. uh, when uh, he does uh, new windows and existing walls, and you need to integrate it into the existing paper, fragile WRB, is you get this plastic flashing and it slips right behind there and yeah, takes care of it. That stuff is handy. Very. It, uh, you know, I might, it's an older house. This thing's going to be leaky anyway, but because he is an air sealing fanatic, uh, I might throw a little bit of caulk behind the back of that. Uh, and seal the gaps in the sheathing and stuff? Yeah, well, it can't not, hurt. Yeah, can't hurt. You know. Tape? Mid, tape, yeah, it's dropping a bucket, but. If that corner is going to be way better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I can answer your question. Uh, who was this? Uh, Brad? Cooper. Cooper, the reason the railing is on the corner of the house is because there's always wood there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. When you go from the corner of the house and you do a 16 or 24 inch or whatever layout, mm-hmm. there's wood, then there's a space, mm-hmm. and then... It does, there's not wood again and for another 16 or 24 inches, so right. that's why it's there. Unless your framer was going to be building the railing, too. And, and then he, he put some blocking yeah. in there, <laughs> but no one ever does that, mm-hmm. in my experience. Right. 
that's always something you have to figure out yourself. I frequently do it on my own jobs, but I also frequently put it in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how often that happens. And oftentimes the dimensions of the deck change, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this deck is looking kind of small. You know, I think we should make it a little bigger. And yeah. th then what do you do? All right. So. This decking may have been overspanned also. A composite decking isn't always like you can't yeah. always span it like 16 inches on center. Sometimes no, it's 12. It, it has lots uh, shorter spans, right? Mm -hmm. It depends on the product. Some of them, most of them for a stair in particular, are 12. 12, yeah. Um, and if it's diagonal, it's 12. If it's diagonal, it's 12. Uh, and the earlier iterations of composite decking sucked. Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> in a word. Uh, the new stuff is substantially better, and I think there's some products out there that actually will span 24 inches now. But they're but, rare, so you want to dig into that. You want oh, to yeah. make sure. Absolutely. Most of them are 16, some are 12, some are 24. Yeah, and you keep in mind that those are minimums, too. Right. You know. Yeah, I don't think that, well, of course the bad construction has made the deck bow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's talking about it up or down, but yeah, was, yeah. Just look at my deck. <laughs> yeah. Is yours wonky? <laughs> yeah, it's basically. It, if you look at it from the edge, it looks almost like a bathtub. It's not quite that bad, but it's definitely dished down. Because much the, the joists are ever spanned. I don't know what it is. I mean, it's basically a ground level deck, so I don't know what's going on there. Ground level decks are problematic because they don't try out underneath there. Yeah. And it's hard to tell what's going on. I it's can't all the mold and it fungus out. weighing it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just working, doing some repair work on a ground level deck two weeks ago, and literally when the lumber guy brought the materials onto the deck, he stepped through one of the boards. No <laughs> way. Yeah. Because he was carrying a heavy, heavy yeah. stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was he mad? Uh, he thought it was kind of funny, actually. I'm glad he didn't really get hurt, because uh, you could. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he could have. Broken an ankle or a leg. Tony's a good guy. If Tony's Workman's Comp Company is listening, we don't know anything about that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pro trim. Put that in your uh, quiver of tricks, folks, for mm -hmm. flashing things in existing uh, applications, right? Yeah. That's, that's a great tip. Yep. Window trim, anything like that, where you're putting a new window in and you want to get some flashing under existing... Uh, WRVs. Side. It's awesome. Yeah. And it's... It's also for like used in place of coil stock, right? Uh, because it's way more dent resistant. Yeah, the stuff I've seen is you can bend it on a break, but it's nowhere near as rigid as aluminum is, so it's a little and floppy I, to work with. And I've heard the corners are not crisp; they're, they're kind of rounded, unlike aluminum. People like that super sharp corner. Right, that's that is true. And you've you've actually used it on a break? I have not. I have, yeah. Yeah, and it's it, it's got a memory; it wants to go back. Like be, all plastics, right? right. I, the the thing they tout in the marketing is that you can do a four sided column wrap, mm -hmm. which obviously you can't do with aluminum because you end up destroying it. But I, I have you tried that? I have not. That that's kind of cool. Yeah, I've only used it in situations like we're talking about For here. For flashing, yeah, yeah. So when you make the four sided thing, you actually tape the fourth corner with probably one of these uh, acrylic adhesive tapes. Hmm. What do you think of that? I don't know. What, what does it look like at the end? It sounds <laughs> terrible. <laughs> like I said, I've only seen marketing photos of it. So I, if I anyone has experience with that, send a, send a photo. This is starting to sound a little bit like fine trailer park. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> fine hokiness. <laughs> On the, <laughs> uh, so we heard from a, uh, an architect. Mm -hmm. And when I saw his email, when it said AIA, Birmingham, mm -hmm. Alabama, when we were, we were discussing Archie speak. Oh, yeah. Was that last time? Uh, Probably. Archibald, yeah, we Kyle used to call around. it back in the day. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> Ross clearly has a, a sense of humor, which I sure appreciate. Uh, he says in episode uh, 186, you mentioned Archispeak, and it reminded me of this spreadsheet someone made. Thought you might get a laugh. And uh, it's, <laughs> it's four columns, right? And you pick a sentence from or a phrase from each one. You combine them, and mm -hmm. you end up with something profound. <laughs> <laughs> Meaningless yet profound. <laughs> Did you pick a favorite? I didn't, but I keep going back to an article I edited, which we can talk about when you're done here. <laughs> so I, I picked one from each, and, and this is what my favorite one was. It says, uh, one might say the energy conservation regulations must utilize and be functionally interwoven with the final qualitative analysis. Well, duh. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> Who can argue with that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you pick out a favorite? I did not, but you can't argue with nonsense. 
<laughs> so one of the first articles I ever did when Kevin Ireton hired me back in 96, and I'm a carpenter off the job site. I've still got sawdust in my pockets when I show up to work. And I've got this architect article on a house out on Long Island, really nice house as it turned out. But in the article, he talked about vertical and horizontal circulation elements. And that meant, like, moving the house sideways or up and down? I didn't really know what it meant, but I figured he was smarter than me, and I left it in there, and Kevin came back and said, What is this? What is this? So I called the architect and asked, and, well, vertical and horizontal circulation elements are halls and stairways. <laughs> <laughs> and so I learned not to be gentle with, uh, with, with editing article, yeah. uh, architect <laughs> articles anymore. Uh why do they need to do that? I don't know. I think it's it's just it's jargon. It makes them part of the tribe. Yeah. Yep. And I don't think all architects do this. No, by certainly any, they any don't. Stretch. Certainly they don't. Uh, when you meet a good one, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, uh, architect design products you're working on, uh, largely, right? These are. Well, we we've done a few architect design product uh, projects uh, since I started, but we're a design build firm. So we like to work with the customer from the inception. Uh, we'll find out what their budget is so that we have an idea of what we can realistically do. Can I interrupt for a second why that's important to folks who are listening? Is like so oftentimes I hear about designers who design things that are totally unrealistic for yeah. the budget of yeah. the client. Yeah. And you're trying to prevent going too far down that path, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So we get an idea of what the budget is and what – they want done what they need done and we have designers that we work with in-house that can then match you know match budget to reality and it makes everybody's life easier uh and, and it, there are less hard feelings there right? are less hard feelings and there's an issue there's always this issue with clients not trusting builders going in and certainly there are some sure. builders that you shouldn't trust but <laughs> i don't know why you say that <laughs> But if you look at, you know, pick three building companies that do the same level of work, and they've all got the same overhead, they've got the same insurance, they're probably using some of the same subcontractors, they're buying from the same suppliers, their costs... Are similar. They're going to be very similar. Or should be. They should be. Um, and you end up picking the one that you're most comfortable with, and we end up with a really good dialogue with our customers, and we end up with satisfied customers at the end of the job. Um, and it brings it in with, uh, I won't say no surprises, because working on old houses, there's yeah. always a surprise. But good communication handles that, and we, uh, we end up with customers who, at the end of the project, when asked about their, to rate their level of happiness, which we do. every I have a weekly meeting with a client, and usually it's over the phone. Uh, and, and the last question is, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, how, how are we happy? doing? Yeah. And the last one I did was 10s all the way through. And it was because of our approach, and it was because we communicated with her all the way through. How do you get clients like that? I wish we had more of them. She, <laughs> was, she was great. Yeah. I mean, that's part of this equation, too, that builders and designers, uh, I mean, you can decide not to work for people, but you also have to pay the bills. Absolutely. Uh, you can't always, you're, it's a luxury to be able to yeah. fire a client. I'm always interested when uh, I look on my uh, Facebook uh, building groups and, and people say they refuse to do whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm just like, well, so you get to say you don't get use plywood on this project? And like, mm -hmm. really? <laughs> you get to say we, we're not doing that because I don't want to? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't see that being realistic. I don't think it is. And, you know, we have... Uh, we have a gold standard there. You know, this is, this is how we would love to construct something from top to bottom. You can't always do that. Right. Every building ever made is That's a compromise. compromise. Yeah, because and... people don't have limitless money. Right, And exactly. even if they do, they're not willing to spend all of it. Right. We'll make this exactly as you like if it takes the last dollar you've got. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you get happy clients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know, that's an exaggeration, of course, but it's good building costs money. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the truth. Well, it's been a pleasure having you here today. It's been great hanging out with you guys. Do you think you would do this again? I would do this again anytime. Really? Oh, uh, yeah. As it on a scale of one to ten, how did we do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't want you guys to get swollen heads. But <laughs> I would say it was a, a nine. Uh, you're being charitable. That's the highest score I've ever gotten. 
We could ask the listeners to give us a scale on one to ten, like oh, Andy, no. but I'm no. worried about that. Well, yeah. I want to be able to sleep at night. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to uh, everybody for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Remember to send us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Thanks, and happy building. Happy building.